30 years ago in Austin, Texas, four teenage girls were murdered in a yogurt shop. And to this day, the case remains unsolved. Erin Moriarty brings us a preview of this week's episode of 48 Hours. So what is all of this here? These are my notes. It's been 30 years since John Jones led the search for the killers of four teenage girls in an Austin yogurt shop. He has since retired from the Austin Police Department, but the images of December 6, 1991 remain all too vivid. I can still see them. Eliza Thomas, Jennifer and Sarah Harvison and Amy Ayers have been tied up and shot in the head. Then the yogurt shop was set on fire. A task force worked to find suspects. We looked at everybody from family members to drifters. Meanwhile, the victims' families and the city of Austin grieved. I remember the shock. Sonora Thomas was 13 years old when her only sibling, Eliza, was murdered. You just hold on to anything you can to get through these moments that are so impossible. Open the door! Over the decades, there were arrests, even convictions, but those convictions were overturned. It left Jones and the families in emotional turmoil. There is a kind of torture that continues by the fact that it's unsolved and it's ongoing. But there may be hope. Male DNA called YSTR was found on one of the victims. It was an incomplete sample, but with advances in DNA research, there's a chance that the sample obtained 30 years ago may solve this case. Jones made a pledge to the families involving the shirt he wore on the night of the murders. The next time they saw me with that green and white shirt on, that, that was a signal to them that, you know, we knew who did it. And John Jones has kept that shirt all these years later. I just hope one of these days we can put this thing to bed for the family's sake. Mm. So Aaron is here to break down the reporting. 30 years. I mean, it's clear that this was like a bomb going off for the families uh, of the victims, but also the people city who was it? The right. city of Austin. The it's still Austin. anyone who grew up and then mm -hmm. if you say the yogurt shop murders, mm -hmm. everybody knows. I mean, it was and it remains the worst case I have ever covered. Mm -hmm. When you have four children, one of them was 13. And so what also has happened, there was a lot of pressure to uh, resolve and solve this case. And so when every time they would make arrests and there were two big arrests and convictions, then the family goes to court, then those convictions were overturned. And Sonora told me, Sonora is the little sister of Eliza Thomas, mm -hmm. um, one of the young women who were killed. She said, and I'd never heard this before, that her parents never ever talked about her sister. They couldn't. Mm. Wow. It was too heartbreaking. But you're 13. It's the biggest case in town. Your sister was murdered and your parents aren't talking about it. She actually developed physical pain from this. Mm. And the other thing that really struck me about this case is the impact on the investigators. Mm -hmm. John Jones, who was, again, high profile, a lot of pressure to solve it. And John Jones put his whole life into it. His marriage suffered. He was diagnosed with PTSD. Mm. So I think we don't realize the impact of a 30-year case on the victims, on the town, on mm. the investigators. Yeah. So why has it been so difficult to solve this case? Well, let's start from the very beginning, because whoever killed these girls, Girls, shot them, piled up their bodies, it's a hard part for me to talk about, and then burned them. So not only was evidence destroyed, but there was soot everywhere. And as John Jones had always said to me, so you really couldn't do fingerprinting. Mm. And then another thing is, in a high profile case like this, and this always shocks people, there were six written confessions, people who didn't do it, who came forward, who had to be investigated, who had it seemingly the facts right, but there were so many facts out publicly. So that has really hurt. Um, but now the hopeful thing is this DNA. And I know Anne Marie knows yes, more than no, anybody yeah. about the whole, you hear DNA, genetic genealogy, great. The problem with this, it is a partial profile. But here's the hopeful news. So they used it when they first had it, they only had 16 markers. But recently they did testing and they were able to get 25 markers. And so the hope is that at some point they are going to have enough with newer tests that it's going to point to somebody. And the fact where the DNA came from 
indicates it was someone involved in this. And so here's the thing about DNA, though, is it's a great piece of evidence, but you can't build a case just on DNA. So do they have other evidence? Well, you know, and that's really why the two guys whose convictions were overturned, that's why they weren't charged, because they were eliminated by that DNA. And there wasn't, all they had were these confessions. And with that DNA, you just didn't have enough to go. Here's the most intriguing part, and it has bothered me from the beginning. So there were witnesses um, who were in the yogurt shop before it closed. And they all remember two men in their 20s who were sitting at a table away from everybody else. They weren't eating or drinking. That's why they noticed them. They were mm. odd and they were whispering. Mm. To this day, there are no pictures of them. There are no drawing. They were never identified. Wow. And so every time I do this show um, and look at this case, I keep hoping against hope that somebody who knows something will mm. finally say, 30 years, it's time to solve this. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, Aaron, as always, uh, fascinating. Thank you for joining us. Thank you this. for having Looking me here. Looking forward to seeing the report. Be sure to check out this 48 Hours episode on your local CBS station and Paramount Plus tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern. And you can stream it right here on CBS News Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern.